Welcome to the risk management portion of our single pilot resource management course. Now we have uh, throughout our courses some video presentations and please be reminded that they're simulations only, that the actors are actually our safe pilots. Risk management. What is risk management? It is the ability to consistently make informed decisions in a timely manner based on the task at hand and with a thorough knowledge and use of all available resources. That's important. Use all available resources. Now again, we can use the what if that we've covered in other modules. Um, instead of remembering all these acronyms, if you just say what if constantly, you will s ask yourself a question and hopefully you will be able to give yourself a reasonable answer that's going to make the flight safe. These are the risk elements. Pilot in command is P, airplane is A, environment is the V, operations is O, and pressures is P. You're going to see these recurring again and again throughout this module. Now, assessing the risk. Depending on a pilot's experience and the attention to detail, each pilot can assess the risk differently. If you're very well experienced, you may look at icing conditions in a different light than if you were a single engine pilot that had no de-icing equipment on your airplane. Risk management demands that the pilot makes informed decisions and that's based on the task at hand and it draws from the thorough knowledge of his or her resources. You've got to use everything you have at hand in order to make sure that this flight is going to be successful. Now here's a, just an example, experience assessment. Here's a light skim of ice on the wings. So what you're going to say is, do we or do we not operate the de-icing equipment? And it's fine if you um, are an experienced pilot, you know exactly how much ice you need on the airplane to be able to effectively operate the boots. Um, if you're a pilot that's never been in icing, you're gonna panic. The first bit of ice, man, you're gonna wanna pop those boots. You also have to realize what kind of airplane you have whether you have de-icing or anti-icing. So this is basically an experience level. You have to have a certain number of, uh, amount of experience in order to be able to assess certain risks. Here's the assessment factors, the type of aircraft, like we just said. You know, do you have de-icing equipment or not? What kind of de-icing or is it anti-icing? What is the temperature? Is this temperature going to facilitate icing conditions or not? The flight conditions, is there more ice coming um, are you going out of the icing conditions or are you just getting into the icing conditions? Um, climb or descend, are those an option? Is it going to be, you're going to be able to get on top where you can break off the ice or are you going to be able to descend where it's going to be um, rain and the temperatures are going to be warmer? Experience in icing conditions, like we just said, you know, it depends on how much you've been in icing conditions with your particular airplane, whether you're going to be able to assess the risk differently. Now has enough ice accumulated to warrant de-icing. That's an experience thing as well. And also for training. Go with someone who's very well uh, experienced in your airplane, who has flown it a lot in, these, in the kinds of conditions that you are going to be experiencing and ask their advice. If worse comes to worse, you just say what if, all right? Evaluate the risk, determine your options. Decide on a course of actions, but be ready to alter your plan if the situation changes. Too many people make a decision and then they follow it into the grave. No, you have to sit there and know, have a lot of situational awareness and look at the big picture. Remaining flexible is the key. And what if we get into ice? That's a what if. What if another altitude is warmer? What if the weather is clearer just north of our course? Should we go out of our way to stay out of potential ice? These are things that you can ask constantly while you're flying in the environment just in case that kind of situation should arise. If you ask them on the ground, you may want to postpone the flight because your risk assessment has said either the airplane or the pilot or the weather conditions are not really conducive to a happy outcome. Here's a risk element. The first one we're going to go over is pilot. Now we cover this a lot in the Human Factors module, so I suggest that uh, to get more information you go and take that course. Illness, you're not going to fly if you're sick, or if you do, you're, you're kind of stupid. Um, 
because you can't think properly when you're really feeling bad. Medication, if you're taking certain medication, you better decide and talk to your doctor to make sure it's okay to fly with that. Stress, stress is, it will definitely affect your thinking ability and your um, risk assessment factors. Um, alcohol, we already know all about that. Fat fatigue, if you're tired, you cannot effectively judge whether you're tired or not, but you also can't judge whether you're making a proper decision. Eating, we talk about eating because if you're malnourished, then your brain isn't going to operate. Well, if you're dehydrated, you have, you're electrolyte deficient, also you're not going to have the spark so that the brain isn't going to be able to send the proper signal from one place to the other, and you're not going to get a, a good message back so that you can make proper decisions. The bottom line is, and I'm safe, don't fly. If you're sick, tired, hungover, pressured, stressed, hungry, on medication, or dehydrated. And like I said, again, you can go to the Human Factors module to learn more about that. And we just want to clarify one thing, that dehydration doesn't just mean chugging water, because most of the bottled water that you buy in the store or at the FBL has been filtered and a lot of the electrolytes have been removed through the filtering process. The electrolytes are the spark that keeps your brain firing. You need to put those back in. We have a, one that we use, it's called Sharp Crew, it's by Electroblast, and it actually um, gives you the electrolytes, you just squirt it in your water and it helps to keep your brain firing so you can make a proper decision. Intervention. This is one thing people don't uh, don't realize, by the way, that's uh, my father in the picture up there in 1926. Uh, safe pilot doesn't have a specific personality and neither does a reckless pilot, but different personalities can affect the outcome of the flight. If you see a pilot who is either looks like he's visibly hungover or he's really pressured or he's ticked off and he's just walking around the airplane kicking the tires and yelling and screaming at himself, you might want to intervene and say, you know, you might want to think about not flying today. They might not like the intervention, but you get enough people together. If you really see a pilot doing something unsafe, you don't want them to kill themselves and you don't want them to, to run into you in the air or hit someone in a house below if they decide to um, do something stupid. Attitude, big key to effective risk management. Personality types that fit into specific roles can add negatively to your ability to assess the risk of the flight. Here's a situation uh, in a video and we're going to see if you do something similar to this. Matt, thanks for coming with me tonight. I really need to brush up on my land skills. No problem. But you're still piling command, so maybe we ought to figure out who does what if we have an engine failure. So don't be afraid to say something, to see something you don't like, like if anything happens like an engine failure, I'll make sure to stay on the stick and make sure we're going to go in safe. You just make sure we got the checklist done and keep the radios handy and everything else, but I think we'll be good if we do that. Okay, I'll go for the fuel pumps, the carb heat, and uh, the mixture. And uh, if it doesn't come back, then I'll fly the airplane while you switch the fuel tanks. And uh, if we're still going down, then you can fly the airplane and I'll pray. have a pilot in the right seat, this type of coordination lessens the risk. These guys it's a, uh, did a really good thing. All right, The captain, he was probably his airplane or he rented it, he was a pilot in command. He took a friend along who was also a pilot. And instead of saying things like, I am the captain, you do what I say, or if you sit there and go, um, you know, if we do an emergency, this is the way it's going to be handled. Why don't you say, hey, look, you know, we're a team. Well, there's two of us here. If there's something going wrong, maybe we should get together and and do uh, like a cockpit resource management. There's a there's two ways to handle this. Okay, I'm the captain. Do what I say. Let me handle everything. Just work the radios. All right. Or you could sit there and say, hey, normally I fly single pilot, especially if you're in a, in a 135 situation where you fly when you fly single pilot most of the time. The weather's bad and you have a co-pilot there. What you do is you have to transition and say, okay, I'm used to flying single, hand, single pilot. 
But since there's two of us, let's do some cockpit resource management and let's go over some, some scenarios that could possibly happen and how we would handle them and who's going to do what. Attitudes are high risk. Okay, They're going to affect the, your ability to process information. You're going to affect your ability to assess the risk and to make good decisions. Anti-authority, impulsivity, invulnerability, macho, and resignation. Okay, impulsivity is a big one. People don't really realize that. If you're an impulsive person and, an, and you have an emergency, all of a sudden your hands are going to fly all over the cockpit and you're going to um, want to solve the problem right away. Now, if you're on fire and you're heading for the ground, it's one thing. But if, if there's any small thing, like say, you know, your twin engine airplane and one engine looks like the, it's over temping. Okay, sit down there, take a breath. Don't be impulsive. Read your checklist. Try to figure out what the problem is. Get your airplane flying on a, a specific heading if you're, you know, if you're confused about where you are. You know, get yourself stabilized. You know, the airplane's not going to come out of the sky if you lose one engine. So don't be impulsive. You know, and vulnerability means I can't, you know, get their itis, I can't die, whatever. That's, that's uh, bordering on really being egotistical and macho. So you have to be very, very careful and sort of look at yourself as a personality type and see what you can do to mitigate that. All right? You look in the mirror. It not, attitudes not only reflect the decision at hand, but the progression of decisions that can add to a pilot error mishap. You must be aware of your behavior, and you got to redirect the hazardous attitudes so corrective action can be taken. Now, no one's going to know. You're looking in the mirror. You are actually, you know, doing a self-analysis. You don't have to tell anybody you've got these flaws, but you just have to not carry those flaws into the airplane. And if you're successful at doing that, you can break the chain of events that's normally attributed to an accident. Here's a personal checklist that one of the pilots at Great Barrington Airport um, made up for himself and get, allowed us to uh, put it in this course. Before you fly, you can pre-flight yourself. Find out if you're any of these things, you ought to do a risk assessment. Can you fly with them? Should you fly with them? Should you take someone else with you who maybe doesn't have any of these things in case something happens to you and you just can't function properly? Are you rushed? Are you stressed? Tired? Frustrated? starved, distracted, nervous, pressured, exhausted, aggravated, dehydrated, disoriented, or is the, is, are you over my minimums? You ought to establish a certain amount of minimums. Okay, I'm going to fly with a certain ceiling. If you're IFR and you haven't been flying lately, okay, my personal minimums are 1,000 feet. That's it. Below 1,000 feet, I'm not going. Um, and you know, you just have to do your own personal minimums. If the winds are blowing, uh, you know, gusting to 15, that's one thing. If they're gusting to 30, are those above your airplane minimums and your own minimums. So you have to set these kinds of things for yourself. Okay, you should discipline yourself to a personal am I review. Every half hour while flying, things change. If you starve to death and your blood sugar goes down, you may be affecting your thinking process. You know, are you uh, thirsty? Are you tired? Are you paying attention to flying? Or are you thinking about other things? If you are thinking about other things, what's going on? If you're getting a headache, maybe it's something in the airplane like carbon monoxide that's giving you the headache. Be aware. Uh, it, it, are you determined to complete the mission? Is there anything so pressing that if the weather goes bad and there's a chance of you crashing that you should still press on? You have to ask yourself, and in in, especially in North America, there's airplane airports everywhere. You can always change your destination and get on the ground. Am I annoyed by my passenger? That's a big one. You sit there and say to the passenger, look, this is going to be handled when we get on the ground. This is a, The airplane is a hazardous environment. I need to pay attention. If you want to live, be quiet. We'll discuss it later. And am I scared? If you're scared, you either shouldn't be going up or you should be getting on the ground as soon as possible because it means that you made a wrong decision and you got in over your head. Now you also have to set your own duty times. You know, if you're with a 135 outfit, it's difficult to set your own duty times. It's, it's uh, governed by regulations. But you have to know yourself and you have to know how many hours of sleep you need and um, in order to perform properly, okay? Now you gotta consider your experience level. How are you fixed for the weather? You know, are you IFR? Um, current if you're an instrument pilot. 
do you know how, how what the wind velocity is and and how um, can you have you practiced good crosswind landings in the past you know, the, the length of the trip you know you're gonna have to go to the bathroom halfway through is this gonna affect your ability to you know think properly if you if you are got a low approach and you and it's bad and you should really miss but you have to go to the bathroom which happened to me once and I landed anyway um, is it day or night how current are you at night how comfortable are you at night is your fatigue and hunger factors uh, satisfied um, I'm safe keep going over the ons I'm safe all the time a tired pilots can't think straight we talk a lot about fatigue in the human factors module um, and studies have shown that tired pilots are less capable of assessing their own levels of fatigue. So this can cause pilot error. They can't effectively do an en route risks assessment if you're getting tired. You're not a able to understand how tired you are and how it's affecting your ability to think properly. Now as a general aviation pilot, you should abide by the preset rules that we just said before, you know, in the, in the slides before. When you're when you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, when you're all, you know, a normal, not tired, not hungry, not sick, you set yourself a bunch of rules, and those are your benchmarks. After that, you know, if you're tired and you look at those benchmarks and realize that there's something different, then obviously you have to look at yourself and say, what is making me not be able to do proper risk assessment? You know, I must be tired. Now, professional pilots, here we are, same thing. You know, for charter pilot, you have to assess the risk at a time when you're not tired. And then you have to match that against future flights to see exactly what if there is any difference. Circadian rhythms, if you're all of a sudden a, a charter pilot and you normally fly during the day and then all of a sudden you get a couple of night freight runs and your whole body clock goes off, you got to be careful because it's going to take you a day or two to get back in sync and you could be at risk during that time. Um, tired people cannot accurately assess their own levels of fatigue. Now, the time for pilots to employ this risk management technique is before the flight is scheduled. Look at the schedule, look at your, you know, your eating habits, your exercise, your sleep patterns, and seeing if this is you know, uh, conducive to you having a successful flight. Now, you might want to go and talk to management if they're scheduling some bizarre flights where you're going to be really tired you know because of the schedule and say hey look you know you, you know you don't want me to make a big hole in the ground you don't want me to scare the passengers so maybe you ought to think about how you're scheduling this and and work it out with a couple other pilots so that we all don't get too tired they might not listen to you but you can try all right this site this is a, a good crash for a good example of a lot of um, different factors of what we talked about today. This was a woman, uh, she was a, a Cessna, um, Cessna type rated pilot. Um, she had a lot of experience in the airplane. She'd been to you know, school, flight safety or whatever. Um, and I wanna read you the transcript of this crash and what happened so that you can start thinking of the things that went wrong along the way. Um, she uh, was an internet marketing entrepreneur. She was flying single pilot with her 10 year old son. She had been on vacation and told friends she was bored with the slow play pace in Maine. Her last recurrency was three years prior. Now she had 3,000 hours, but she hadn't been to school in a while. She showed up at the airport at 5 p.m. evening night in the winter, checked the weather, and was told of a sigmet for severe turbulence and mixed and clear icing in the clouds with precip occurring at her departure airport. She mentioned that the weather was cruddy. Now, what she didn't realize was that the um, freezing rain had left a skim of ice on the cars in the parking lot, about a quarter of an inch thick. Hello! <laughs> you know, do you think that maybe the weather is really cruddy. Um, now what happened was is they, to make room for another airport, uh, airplane in the hangar, they, the maintenance people took her airplane out about an hour before her flight. So what do you think? If there's freezing rain on the cars in the parking lot, don't you think maybe her airplane might have had a skiv of ice on it? Um, after loading the airplane, they asked her if she wanted to be de-iced and she said no. 
The weather had turned from light snow to freezing rain and a skim of ice, you know, ha had occurred all over the airport. So we assumed that there was ice on her airplane and why she said, no, we have not a clue. Now she started up, received her clearance and began to taxi. She neglected to turn on the taxi lights with the airport common air traffic radio frequency and taxied onto the snow covered grass and she ended up in a ditch. Applied power to get out of the ditch. Uh, you know, maybe there's someone's trying to tell you you shouldn't be going. An airport employee hearing the noise turned on the runway and taxi lights. Wow, now she knew where she was. She then taxied to runway 35 and then changed her mind to runway 17. Now she took off climbing to 10,000 feet and upon climb out was issued a clearance direct to Syracuse, which she acknowledged. At 3,500 feet and 267 knots, she declared an emergency, stating that she did not know which way she was turning due to an attitude indicator failure. Radar showed the plane in a tight left turn and rapidly descending until the radar return was lost. Now they assumed that she got spatial disorientation. Um, they didn't know if icing had a factor at that point, um, whether you know her instruments were caused because of icing, her instrument failures. Um, and the, the big thing is, is the citation had redundant systems, so all she had to do was flip a switch and the flight display could have been switched to, to the correct altitude failure and gone to the standby indicator. She didn't do that. She had a standby indicator. If you can look at the picture, right in the middle underneath there, she has standby instruments. She could have looked at that right away instead of looking at her um, flat screen. So the risk management violations, I'm sure you've been thinking about them all through this little scenario. The pilot element, she had ego or complacency, get there itis, whatever. Air pilot element was sitting in the freezing rain for an hour. Environment element, she didn't consider the ice, night, and the sigmund. The operation element, did she consider taking a cold pilot with her? The pressure element, get home itis. That's a false one. She could have stayed overnight. She could have gone the next morning. She decided, made that wrong decision. Now the accident chain of events, her emotional need to get out of a boring place, not taking the weather, and the sigmets seriously, not relating to the ice on the cars and refusing de-icing. That one, I have not a clue. I can't understand that at all. Forgetting to turn on the taxiway lights, getting stuck in the ditch, changing departure runways. All these things, you know, are starting to accumulate. You'd think she would sat there and say, hey, you know, there's too many things that are weird here. Maybe I ought to taxi back. Losing situational awareness by focusing her scan on only the PFD attitude indicator and not having been to recurrency training lately and practice emergency procedures. Hey, flipping the switch, going to the standby. Hello, you know, practice this. This is what we say, If you, the what if. if. Even if you're just in a single engine airplane and you don't go to recurrency training other than the WINGS program, every time you fly, ask yourself what if. This will constantly refresh in your mind what you have to do if you have an emergency. And don't let this be you. Could taking a time out to get perspective on any of these links have changed the outcome? Think about that. Now this is the end of part one. We can let you mull that over over a break and come back soon and go to part two. Welcome back to part two of risk management. Here's a risk element, the airplane. We've just gone over pilot, now we're going to go into airplane. How well do you know your airplane's performance limitations? In um, one of the other uh, seminars that we give, we talk about a Hawker crash, and basically it's because the pilots didn't go to the books and realize that the airplane could stop for the conditions indicated on the runway, and they tried to initiate a go around, which they blew it and they ended up making confetti out of the airplane. But the airplane's performance charts showed that they could have successfully stopped even though it was going to be kind of dicey. So you have to know your own airplane performance limitations. And you do this on the ground. Uh, have you reviewed systems failures lately? This is another thing when we talk about the what if. You can do this in the airplane if you've got a simple airplane when you're flying along. 
and uh, you know, just continue to ask yourself, what if we had a fire? What if this engine, this, the, the, all the electrics uh, failed? What if our GPS went dead? You know, what if um, the, uh, you know, we had a split flap? I mean, there's all sorts of things that you could s just sort of concoct and find out um, what you could do if you don't know the answer. As long as you have your POH with you, look it up while you're flying along. How current are you in this particular airplane? Don't go flying an airplane without an instructor that you haven't been in in a while, because you may be reacting to something in a completely different way when uh, an emergency happens. Did you ask any pilots who flew this ship recently if there were any problems? If you constantly run a flight school airplane, do you always write a note to the next pilot saying, oh, this was in op, be careful, or tell the desk this was in op? Ask the other pilots. A lot of people don't do this. They forget. And, uh, or if there's a, a, something that's a little sticky or not working properly or, you know, there's a glitch with the autopilot, you know, someone should tell somebody and then you as a pilot in command is responsible to find that information out. Is this aircraft properly equipped for your type of flight? Don't go into icing conditions without de-icing equipment. All right. Um, it, don't go into night flight if all your, you know, your cockpit lights don't work. I mean, there's all sorts of things, but you have to make sure that the airplane can handle the conditions you're setting it in. Don't go flying in crosswinds that exceed the capability of the airplane. How much fuel reserve do you need for the flight, including unforeseen delays? Um, people run out of gas in airplanes all the time. Have not a clue why. I mean, there's so many airplane airports you can land at to get fuel. No one should run out of fuel. Always look at the fuel tanks. Never trust the gauges totally. Go on time and what you know um, you burn an hour. Does the fuel quantity gauge match what was put on board plus what was already there? Again, make sure that you check your fuel, not just rely on the gauge. Okay, the risk element, here's the environment. Well, you wouldn't go out in uh, lightning storms like that, but the environmental risk management considerations are weather. Obviously, you're not going to go out and fly in weather that you don't think you can completely save, uh, complete the flight safely. ATC, use ATC. You know, PIREPs um, are really good on the ground, but they're very short-lived. So if you're flying along and all of a sudden you see some, some uh, anomaly, or you, you're in a certain kind of turbulence or, you know, between layers or whatever, you know, you might want to give a pie rep, but also if you see something coming up and you're not sure, call ATC, ask if any other aircraft ahead have had that, uh, have had any kind of problems. You know, utilize them. Uh, nav aids, you know, you can use your nav aids or GPS. Make sure you know how to run your GPS um, and make sure that um, all of the, um, the nav aids are operational you know, including all your, your satellite information, make sure everything is operating properly. You don't want to get erroneous information. Airports and runways, you know, know your airport. Know what runways they have. Know if there's construction on one of the runway or if there's a part of it's closed. Um, if you're en route and all of a sudden you have to land at a strange airport because the weather, you know, bring it up. If you know, if you have the uh, electronic equipment to bring up the airport diagram, bring up the airport diagram. Carry a little booklet with you that has all the airport diagrams in there or print them out before you go of your uh, airports along the way. Make sure you're familiar with the airport before, you know, you attempt to land on that airport. Um, obstacles and terrain. Don't fly into mountains. People fly into mountains all the time. They, you know, whether they have, uh, you know, equipment on the air, on the on board the airplane to show you terrain, they still run into terrain. I don't have a clue why. But anyway, know your obstacles. Make sure of your altitude. Know where you are, and make sure you know where uh, the towers are. There's towers going up all the time. If uh, just uh, between. Um, Bradley Airport in Hartford and Brainerd Airport, there is a mountain ridge and there are like 1,500 or 1,800 foot high, you know, transmission towers in that area. And they're these huge, huge, huge towers. And if you're scud riding, you may, you know, run into one of those. So make sure you know where all your towers are in addition to the terrain. Uh, day and night flight, make sure that um, the day or the night flight, the weather is okay, that you're proficient that your airplane is properly equipped for night flight and that you've um, 
you know, you, you've done all your homework and know exactly what to expect on a night flight. Here's risk element operations. Decision making means using all of the factors. You know, ask yourself these things. Does the flight have to be made? You know, is it if it's a joy ride? Oh yeah, we want to go. We don't have to go, but we want to go. We'll assess all the risks. Make sure everything's going to be fine, and you're going to be able to have a successful flight. You know, if you're a 135 operation, obviously you're going to have to go, but maybe you can change the departure here and there depending on lines of thunderstorms or you know severe winds or something like that. Um, how you know how critical is the schedule? The same thing. You know, you have to give yourself that option: canceling the flight, delaying the flight choosing an alternative route. Is the trip worth the analyzed risks? You have to go through all the risks and say, okay, I checked off all these boxes. We're cool. We're going. Are you current and comfortable with the conditions of flight? You know, it's up to you to get that airplane back safely on the ground. So you have to make sure that you can land the airplane in the conditions, whether it's an icy runway, snowy runway, uh, you know, 90 degree crosswind conditions, you know, um, a severe turbulence, Wind shear, I mean, you have to know that you can handle those things if you're going to launch in those kinds of conditions. Is the aircraft equipped for emergencies? Um, now, you can say, okay, well, we know when we go offshore, we have to carry life rafts and all that kind of stuff, right? Life jackets, whatever. But suppose you're just going out to, you know, you're going to run to Catalina from the California, or you're going to run out to Martha's Vineyard. Or, or Nantucket from uh, the East Coast, or you're going to go from South Jersey up to Long Island and they route you out over the water. And they don't care you're in a single engine airplane, but you're going over you know, 30, 40, 50 miles worth of water, and if that engine quits, you're going to go swimming. Are you prepared to go swimming? Do you carry a life raft for those conditions? Absolutely not. So therefore you ought to negate uh, that risk and say, I'm sorry, but I don't have water over water equipment. I need to be rooted on over land. Um, so you really have to know that. Also, if you're in mountainous terrain, do you have survival kits? A lot of people survive crashes, but then die because of the elements. So you have to make sure, even if you're going for a short trip in the mountains, just for the day, you're, you're running around, you know, just sightseeing over the mountains. Suppose you end up crashing at the top of a 3,500 foot peak. It's going to take you a while to hike down, especially if you got a broken leg. Do you have things that can uh, keep you alive until help comes? Okay, risk elements, pressures. You take pressure from your boss, your spouse, your kids, your passengers. Your ego and your desire not to admit to the conditions may be beyond your ability. When you're under stress, you can't think straight. When you say, I have to get there, you, if you're under stress, you may not be able to assess the risks properly. And if you have any physical problems, this may contribute to your stress. So if your stress happens before you get in the airplane, either try to figure out a way to leave it on the ground, don't fly, take a co-pilot. If it's in the airplane, isolate yourself from the stressor. Tell the people, look, you know, I've got enough on my plate because it's turbulent and we've got bad weather and I'm hanging on to the airplane for dear life. Get off my back. We'll talk about it in the morning and then focus on the airplane. Now, here's a team approach for one pilot. All right. This is if you're doing CRM, but it's just for you. Uh, transfer, eliminate, accept, and mitigate. We're going to go through all of these for each individual situation. Okay, for the 135 pilot, okay, um, or even if you have someone else riding along with you. Transfer the risk to another pilot. Okay, eliminate, E, eliminate the risk by canceling the trip. You have that option. A, accept the risk and go. You've done risk management, uh, aeronautical decision making, you've done your I'm safe checklist, and boom, okay, you can go. Or you can mitigate the risk by flying with a co-pilot checking the weather, going a different route, something else. You have these options. Okay, now if you're going to do the team approach for the aircraft, transfer by using another aircraft if you find something wrong with it. You can always eliminate the uh, risk by canceling. You could also accept the risk and go after you've done your risk assessment. You can also mitigate by reviewing other options. You know, another airplane, getting maintenance out to fix you, talking to people who have been flying this airplane before you, it's just an anomaly that happens once in a while, you know, whatever. Now, here's a team approach for the environment. Okay, you can transfer the risk 
by modifying the route or asking an IFR pilot to go with you if you're not rated. Uh, you can eliminate by canceling the trip. You can accept after doing the risk assessment and go, or you can mitigate the risk by reviewing alternatives and options while you're on the ground. Now you can do this in the air, but why not try to get your options all lined up on the ground before you launch. Now here's a team for operation. Transfer by discussion, discussing options with dispatch, a weather briefer, or a flight instructor. Get other people to help you. If you're not sure, say, hey, look, you know, uh, let's all talk about this. What do you think? You know, ask them. Get a team approach going. You can always eliminate by canceling. You can always accept and go after risk assessment. Or you can mitigate, mitigate by analyzing all your available data, the weather, the route, the schedule, and the need for the operation. Now the team for external pressures, all right, if you have a lot of stress in your life and people are bugging you, um, what you do is you can transfer to another pilot or co-pilot if you have one, um, or invite someone to go along with you. You can eliminate by canceling the trip. You can accept and go. Or you can mitigate by reviewing expectations, discussing alternatives, or own, owning up to your own fears and limitations. The external pressure is in your head it's something that you have surrounded yourself with and only you can get rid of it and only you can make a dis, uh, an effective de decision on whether you should go or not. Now this is the end of our risk management module. We invite you to use a lot of the acronyms that we have given you in this. If you forget them, just say I'm safe uh, you know, for yourself and, and what if, if you've got a problem. But remember, the time to assess the risk is on the ground where you go.